And what we do is that we get these independent tasks and each task is an item that needs to be processed. And an item can be an email that needs to be sent, a range of database keys that need to be scanned, a frame that needs to be rendered, and so on. And here we assume that you have such kinds of workload and that each task is independent of each other. So we ruled out uh, workloads where the tasks need to communicate when they're executing, okay? So what are the consequences of having your infrastructure compromised? And to be able to discuss about that, we need to discuss the threat model that we assume here. And we assume a threat model that is very strong, so you have a very powerful attacker. For example, you have an attacker that can get administrative access to the infrastructure because maybe he or she works for the cloud provider or has impersonated an uh, administrator or because he has compromised the host, the operating system, the firmware, the management interface before. Or even because he has uh, exploited vulnerabilities in the software stack to get root access. And especially when you talk about vulnerabilities in the software stack, it's very difficult to protect against that because it's a lot of software to protect. So you have, for example, 20 million of lines of code in Linux, 21 million in KVM, 9 million in, in OpenStack. And we know that statistically there are a lot of critical bugs in there. And bugs in, this, uh, par in the parts that are critical in this software can lead to unrestricted access to data and code. So it's a very difficult thing to protect. And the user of the cloud provider needs to trust in everything that he or she does not control. Okay, so this is the, the threat model. So what can we do about that? So here in the, in the slide, I have an example of the, the applications that we are uh, we are doing right now. And in this example, we have things like smart meters and other sensors connected to a power grid. And these sensors and data sources, they produce information that is collected and stored. And then you have other applications that access this storage to do things like data analysis, billing, uh, detect uh, extreme conditions on the, on the power grid. And if you have an attacker that can compromise the infrastructure, uh, the attacker could change data or steal data from the storage or even modify the applications that are running to leak sensitive data or to modify the computation results. And for example, in the, the smart grid area, it's known that the smart grid data is very sensitive because you can derive a lot of private information from there, like the behavior of the users, the devices that they use on their daily routines, and so on. So we want to protect them. And what can we do? So first we can use encryption for data at rest. So if you implement this correct, what do you do? You get the encryption keys to be provided to the applications as they run, so not stored in configuration files. And if you do that, then what happens is that your applications can be modified to encrypt data every time that they write something to stable storage. But that's not enough because an attacker could get hold of your memory and steal your encryption keys. And there is one more thing that we can do. So we can do attestation. Attestation is something that's it's more uh, sophisticated but much more interesting because if you have an infrastructure that can validate if the running application is the same application that you expected it to be run, and only provide secrets and certificates and everything to this application if it was not modified, then you have much more power because now the attacker cannot steal encryption keys by modifying the application to leak them, okay? So um, once you have the patterns for data processing and you have the security, I also want to highlight the importance of quality of service. So for example, we have a workload that runs periodically. So each 10 minutes, it needs to do a bunch of simulations. And 
although the, the workload is very close to each other in each time slot, it can vary, and it can vary for a lot of reasons. For example, if you are in a, in a multi-tenant environment, you can have other workloads that put pressure on the storage, on the network, or on the servers. And even if you don't have that, the different data used in, in a different slot can have another access pattern and take much more time than the previous workload. So it's important to monitor the progress and make sure that you have progress that is aligned with your uh, timeliness requirement. In this example here, we have a workload that is running in a cluster with uh, 10 pods. And here we have the yellow line representing the progress of time, so it's a straight line. And the green line represents the progress of the application itself. And what you see here, that there are two moments where there were uh, interference caused by other load that was imposed on the cluster. And as a consequence, because you did not adjust the amount of resources in the cluster, at the end, you have a delay. So in this case, the application got late. So it used 15% more time than it should. So that's the, the motivation for quality of service. Now that I expect that you understand my motivations and my assumptions, I'm going to talk to you about the, the tools that we use. And starting with uh, Kubernetes, so we use Kubernetes job to implement uh, data processing applications. And the advantage is that we can leverage from the maturity and the ecosystem and the activity, active community from Kubernetes to implement the applications. And also because this um, Kubernetes job entities, it represents very well the concept of batch processing. So we have a number of things that need to be done uh, in contrast to a, a server that runs continuously. And when these things are finished, then your application has finished. And if you take a look into the, the, the Kubernetes uh, jobs and how people use it, you face several decisions, like should you have one job entity per item? Should you have one job entity for all the items that need to be processed? Then you can have another decision. Should you have one pod for each item, and each pod is instantiated knowing which item it needs to be processed? Or should you have a set of pods that will access the items, and then you can play with the number of pods that are run? And finally, you can decide if you have the pods accessing the input items themselves, or if you use a structure to manage the items. And of course, if you think about that, for most cases, you see that one job with all the items, having n pods accessing all the items and using a work queue is more efficient because you can control the number of pods according to your workload and your timeliness requirements. But there is a problem with that because once you do that, maybe you need to change your application to be aware of the queues. And then this is something that we can solve it with another tool, which is Asperatus. So the, the idea of Asperatus is to be an open source tool for orchestrating data processing application. And the advantage of it is that it is very flexible. It's based on plugins. And as a, examples of this flexibility, you can have plugins that consider very specific user-defined metrics for applications. So you can uh, decide orchestration based on make spam, like in our case, latency, throughput, and anything else that you can model. The other thing is that you can connect plugins to deal with different types of infrastructures. So you can have uh, Asperatus managing VMs in OpenStack, containers in a Mesos cluster, uh, tasks in Spark clusters, or as in our case, pods in Kubernetes, okay? So the overall architecture of Asperatus is composed of four components. You have the manager, which triggers the execution, so, so you customize the manager with a plugin that handles with a specific infrastructure. You have the monitor that collects application or cl cluster metrics, 
and then normalize this matrix to be used by a controller, which applies some control logic to actuate back on the infrastructure. And then you have a visualizer component that is basically a dashboard that shows application-specific metrics or cluster metrics. So in our case here, we consider a set of plugins for these components, which we name uh, cube jobs, which means that we have an actuator here that knows how to talk to Kubernetes APIs. We have um, a monitor plugin here that looks into queues of tasks. And we have here uh, a manager that knows how to uh, instantiate jobs into the Kubernetes cluster. And for security, what we do is we based our work on the technology named SGX, so from Intel. And this technology, it introduces the notion of an enclave. And the enclave is a piece of memory that is protected and isolated from other software running in the same machine. And the idea is that everything that you put inside that enclave is, is measured. So you have a hash of the code that is loaded there so that later you can ask which code, which code originated that enclave. And then in practice, you have three things. So you have the memory that is isolated because every time that you write something to RAM, this is encrypted before it leaves the processor and the keys are inside the processor. You have the measurement of the code that was loaded because once you load the code, you can later ask for a proof from the processor that that code was actually the code that originated that enclave. And you have these two things protected from other code running on the same machine, even code with higher privilege levels. So um, to give you a visual summary, what happens is that uh, in a typical application stack, you have a very large attack surface that includes the whole application, the operating system, the hypervisor, and the hardware. And if you choose to use this technology, you limit the attack surface to pieces of your application because you don't trust the complete application. You take the operating system and the, the hypervisor out of the equation, and even some parts of the hardware are taken out of the trust base. And, but the problem is, if you decide to use Intel SGX, you may need to change your application. You may need to recode your application to use the SGX uh, feature. So creating an enclave, uh, loading data into the enclave. And the specific reason is that it's very hard to do system calls when you are inside an enclave. And to circumvent this problem, you have tools such as Scone that helps you by translating legacy application into applications that we will execute uh, into, inside the enclaves. And they do things like they have a synchronous queues to handle the, the syscalls. And in the case of, of Scone, what you need to do when you want to put your application into this secure mode, you recompile your application using GCC uh, with a special libc library, or even you recompile the runtime in which your application runs. So for example, you recompile the Python interpreter, and then you use your Python applications with this new interpreter, and they will run inside the enclave. So once you have your application recompiled, or the runtime recompiled, what you need is to repack your application into a container, and then you will write your Kubernetes manifest file as you did before, but now you have one more capability, which is just environment variables, but that represents integrity information, so for the hashes of applications that you are going to load. And that's, uh, the goal is to protect the secrets from being given to applications that were modified. And I will show you an example in a second. So uh, once you have your uh, manifest file with your uh, typical secrets and with the new integrity information, you will use another tool to split, split your, your manifest file. So you have two parts. You have one part that has only the hashes of the applications and the secrets 
that should be given to these applications. And the other part, which is a manifest file, traditional, but with no secrets. All the secrets have been taken out of this, this manifest file. And then this now secret-free manifest file can be submitted to a Kubernetes cluster in a place that you may not trust completely. As an example, here you have the top of a manifest from a, a job submission. So it's basically the same. The only difference is that now you're mapping the, the SGX device from the, the host into the container. And now for the different part, you would see something like that. So typically you would have an environment vi variable that receives a credential or a, a key. And now you have these environment variables that represent the hashes of the application and of its dependencies. So you don't want this thing to be accessible to your untrusted cloud provider, if it is the case, because he would then get a hold on your keys or even modify the integrity constraints of your submission. So you want to transform this into this, and this is done by, uh, uh, by the same tool. So it removes all the secrets and sensitive information and adds just information that will let the application know where should it look for the sensitive data. And to show it uh, visually, so you have the, the Kubernetes manifest here. It contains hashes of the applications and keys that should be assigned to these application hashes. And the other part, which contains no secret, can be submitted directly to an unmodified Kubernetes cluster. And now, when the application is started, what happens is that because it received a, a wrapper during the recompilation process, or the runtime received this wrapper, uh, as soon as it starts, it will get those environment variables and go to a, a service that is responsible for provisioning the secrets. And there, it will compare the uh, integrity proof from the processor with the hash pass it directly by the developer uh, client line, uh, client command. And if this hash is matched, then what happens is that you have the key being provisioned to the application inside this uh, enclave space. If the application is unmodified, is modified, as we see in the demo, what happens is that when it needs to provide an integrity proof, it will show a different hash, and so you see no match between those, and then it will not receive uh, the, the secret. Okay, so now I'm going to pass the turn to Klenima, who is going to show you some interesting demos. Hello, everyone. So now it's demo time. Uh, we've talked about uh, all the concepts and tools and patterns that we combine together to craft this solution and to enable data processing in trusted environments. So now I wanted to show you two real use cases uh, that actually use the solution to process real data, real world data in a, in a secure and distributed fashion, okay? So uh, both of them, uh, they are similar in the sense that they are uh, smart grid data processing applications. And they roughly follow the same, the same pattern. So the, there's an input that is sensitive and it's encrypted and pushed to the cloud, to object storage. We choose an object storage here because those routines, very often they need to deal with really large amounts of files, of data. So we need a, a scalable storage. And we choose uh, OpenStack Swift for this particular examples. And then we have a worker, which is a piece of software uh, written in a higher level language, such as Python, Golang, Rust, C, Fortran, for example. And then uh, once they, they start, those workers, they are attested. So they talk to an attestation service. Uh, if they are who, they, they, who they, the attestation services expect them to be, then they get the secrets and are able to consume the work items in a work queue. After that, they process the, the item and post the, the outputs back to the object storage. So our first use case here is the system safety simulation. It's a legacy application. It's written in Fortran. 
So it can't be modified. So uh, to deal with that, we abstracted the encryption completely. So using Iscone ability to provide transparent encryption, um, we are then able to uh, abstract completely the encryption of the work items. They are transparently put into a volume, a Iscone volume, which is encrypted, and the keys are posted to, uh, to the attestation service. Then the worker, uh, once it's, it is attested, it's able to retrieve those keys, and then the Iscone runtime will transparently decrypt that volume, that piece of file system, and then the worker will be able to read the contents of the file, just that worker, and uh, write the results back to the same file system. Um, another thing, uh, okay, so to provide that, we wrapped this application in a container that is able to download the encrypted inputs from the object storage, uh, mount the volumes, and then uh, post the, the outputs back to, to Swift once the, the worker is completed. Another important thing to notice here is that, is that this, this application is intended to run periodically. So quality of service here plays an important role because we need to make sure that it's going to finish in time. So Asperatus here keeps controlling and adjusting the resources allocated to this particular worker uh, dynamically so we make sure that uh, the deadline specified by the user is, meet, is met. And it's particularly interesting in multi-tenant environments such as the application is susceptible to external interference. Uh, to, to make things easier for a, from a user experience perspective, we have built a, a, a client that is intended to run in the user trusted machine. So this tool which talks to Asperatus, it's, it, it's capable of encrypting items and pushing them to the object storage, uh, contacting Asperatus to make a submission, keeps track of the progress of it, it also talks to Asperatus Visualizer to provide custom-made dashboards in Grafana so you can follow the progress of your application in real time. And then once it's completed, it's able to download those encrypted outputs and decrypt them locally in, in your trusted, trusted uh, computer. So our approach was to first recompile the code. It couldn't be changed, so we just recompiled it with a SCON GFortran compiler, so it's the same code, but now it runs inside these SGX enclaves, and it's also able to uh, use transparent encryption from the SCON runtime. Then we submit it to Asperatus in each pair of input file and then the simulation parameters, they are, they, they, they become an, a work item in the work queue. So I'm going to show you right now. So this is our application, it looks like this. There's a welcome page here, it runs on the web browser. So once you get started, you go to this page and you see wrappers. Wrappers are basically the name we gave to applications. So today we're going to focus on these two, Organo and Copel. And Organo is the one I was talking about, originally Fortran. So First of all, to create a new submission, we select a Kubernetes cluster. This cluster was provisioned by OpenStack Magnum, and it, is, it, it is supports SGX, so we can bind the, the, the host, the, the SGX device, into the containers. Uh, we're going to submit the inputs, and the inputs here, they describe the, the behavior of a power system so they are sensitive in the sense that they describe the entire behavior of the system. Of course, you don't want uh, unintended access or tampering to this data. Then we submit the worker, which is the recompiled code, uh, the recompiled binary, Fortran binary, that runs inside of enclaves. Then we give some QoS parameters, so I expect, I expect it to finish in 50 seconds. And I also give a minimum and the maximum amount of concurrent workers that the controller is able to, to provision. Then I define here the ctgnum is a simulation parameter because those network files, those models, they can be run against uh, different levels of simulation. And here I'm saying two, it means that I'm running for each submitted model file, I'm running two levels of simulation. So in practice, I am submitting three files, but they are turning into six um, work items in the queue because it's going to run one level per, two levels per, 
per input item. We enable visualizer, then we start with one worker and put it to run. So now what happens is that once submitted, this client is going to encrypt uh, those items transparently. So you see here that it's encrypting and it's, it keeps encrypting and then automatically pushes them to an OpenStack Swift container. So we can see uh, the container being field, so 2794, whoops, we're back, 2794, here it is, lots of connection problems. You can see that it's starting to be to be filled by uh, the input items and it's important to notice that here they are encrypted because we make sure that when outside the user trusted machine, the, in, the sensitive data is either encrypted or inside enclaves. So we can download this one just to make sure it's encrypted. Once it finishes to, put, to post all the inputs to the Swift, then it, it contacts Esperatus and triggers the actual submission. So here we have the CTGNM. We can see nothing. And here, the networking uh, model file, which is also encrypted. And also only- There are text files. Yes, yes. And they, uh, only the worker, once attested, is able to see the content of those files and process it without any change and without having to know anything about cryptography. So now it's created. So it was already submitted to Aspiratus. It has an ID. So currently, Aspiratus might be provisioning all the services it needs to, to run this distributed. So it provisions a Redis, which is a backend for our, our work queue, a Grafana, which is our dashboard, and an InfluxDB to store the metrics. You can see now you can open the Grafana and see the, the progress in real time. You go to submission, you have a dashboard here. You, uh, the, the, the yellow line it represents the passing of time, uh, while the, the green line represents the actual progress of the job. You can see that it was late, but now the controller kicks in and starts to provision more uh, concurrent workers in order to try to meet that deadline, respecting the minimum and maximum amounts I specified. So now it's probably close to finish. 75%, so okay, so now it's finished. And when I go back, it says completed. And now is the next step, which is the client will then download all the encrypted output files that are now in Swift and will decrypt them locally. So if we go to Swift, so it's now decrypting items. If I go to Swift 2794 output, you can see a lot of things here. I can download any of them. And there's, this is the outcome of the simulation, but again, it's encrypted. So by now, the client already downloaded everything, and when it says finished, it already decrypted. So I can go to details and see all my output files decrypted. So I can download any of them. And when I open, now I see the actual results of those uh, computations. So uh, this, is what, this was the first use case. So here we showed how we leveraged all our, our solution to provide a distributed and securely uh, execution to a legacy application that, without any change, was able to have uh, confidentiality and integrity guarantees. So now we have a second use case, which is a bit different in the sense that it's a bit new. So it's a Python, it's a Python script that knows about encryption. So now the user, the user is able to encrypt the files himself, and then it just pushes the, the, the decryption key to the attestation service. So once the, the workers start, they run, they run with a Python interpreter that was compiled with SCON compiler, so it runs inside of enclaves. But before starting, they contact the attestation service that only enables them to run and give, gives them the secrets uh, injected inside the enclave if they are uh, who they need to be, who, they, who the user uh, uh, 
put there in the attestation service. So we'd make sure it wasn't changed at all. Um, after that, uh, the, the client pushes the, the, the files to Swift. This is a bit faster because they are already encrypted, so we don't need to encrypt them transparently. And then we pushes the, the key to the secret management service, and then the worker is able to start. After it finished, it then pushes the results back to the cloud, either to a database or to an to a object, object storage. <laughs> so I'm going to run the second use case here. Going back to our home screen. So Copel, Copel is a partner of ours. It's a power company from Brazil. So this application runs a smart meter data analysis. So the files here, they are sensitive in the sense that they, they are real uh, meter uh, metrics from real users. So they expose the entire consumption behavior of real people. So they shouldn't be uh, unprotected in the cloud. And we again put the same parameters. Now it's a bit different because as we run in Python, we don't provide the binary, but we provide a Docker image. So we crafted this one. This image contains the Python interpreter that runs inside of enclaves and already the worker that's going to run and process those files. So, Active power analysis. Okay. Put it to run. It was sent. Now it's a bit faster because it's, it was submitted, but now we don't have to encrypt anything. We just need to push the already encrypted files to Swift. So it's a bit faster. It was already created. It has a, an Aspiratus ID. So now Aspiratus is again provisioning everything it needs to, to the execution. Provision another Redis, another Influx, another Grafana. <coughs> and soon it will be able to run, to, to spawn the actual workers to take the data, process it, and post the results back to Swift. So if we can go to Swift to see the inputs. They are just to make sure they're encrypted. This one. So you can see that it's already running here. So it's ongoing. So we can also say the Grafana, it finished. Just look, just show you the, the input files encrypted in Swift. Okay, everything encrypted. It's finished, so it's downloaded everything already. So if I go here. I can see the, the, the calculation, which is an aggregated metric to, uh, to, the, to the inputs of the, the smart meters. Maybe you want to jump to the attack? Yes. So now, uh, why not to, to try this attestation service and practice? So now I'm not the user. I'm a bad person. And I'm going to attack it. So let's see how it goes. <laughs> Again. I'm, Pushing the inputs. We're going to run the exact same application. So we put the inputs in there. We don't need to take this. The very same thing. But now, just to make things more clear, uh, we crafted another image, which is the same, but it has a little delay on it. Just the time for me to get inside the container and change the code to leak everything I want. OK? So it's the same. But it is low, this one. So it keeps uh, sleeping for one minute, two minutes is the time I need to go inside the container and try to, to mess with the script, OK? So we enable everything again. What is it? OK, run. Again, it's going to be uh, the, the same process. It's going to push everything back to Swift, the, the inputs that are already encrypted. And as soon as it pro starts to provision things, I, can I have access to the cluster. God knows how I got access to the cluster. I'm a bad person. And 
I'll just wait for them to show up and go inside the containers and try to, to modify the application. So it's now provisioning Grafana. Let's see if we can... Should be appearing at any moment. At any moment. Demo. <laughs> okay, Demo. there we go. So it started one worker. We're going to go inside that worker. To see how things look like from inside. Whoops. Whoops. Is this the VPN? Maybe I put the wrong image. Mm -hmm. Okay, I put the wrong image. I'm a bad person with problems. Bad, dumb. <laughs> a bad, dumb person. Let's try it again. So, going to do it again. It's a live demo, right? And I'm a bad person, I deserve that. No, everything is great. Okay. So. I think it's right now. Enable again. One. Run. <clears throat> OK. Again, posting everything back to Swift. And the goal is to show how the attestation process works in practice. So uh, hopefully, the, the attestation process will fail, and the worker, the compromised worker, won't be able to see anything that it's not intended to see. And that works also for libraries in, in case of, uh, in case of uh, Python applications. So let me just hurry up because we're running out of time. This one, okay, it's running, so it's sleeping now. Okay, mm -hmm. now I'm inside the container, so go to app, see how things look like. You can see a run, so it seems like something I want to go, go there. So just a hash, just to make things fancier. And then we're inside the worker, so what do we want to do? So let me put some things to STD out. Print a key. What about the coded data? Does it sound good to you? So I save it, I quit. Now it has a different hash, because obviously I compromised the application. Let's now hope everything goes well. Actually, I can start to see, uh, I can keep seeing the logs. So it's still sleeping. Very sleepy worker. Should be running at any moment. Okay, it tried to run. It contacted the attestation service, but guess what? It was modified, so no secrets were delivered to this specific worker. So it, it wasn't able to see any uh, encrypted data and get the secrets delivered to the enclave. Okay, so now maybe jump to the conclusions. Okay, so have a slide. Just to finish everything. So conclusions and links. So a brief recap here. So today we saw how we combined um, Kubernetes jobs, the notion of jobs, the native resource in Kubernetes, uh, with Intel SGX and SCON uh, to extend Asperatos to support and provide uh, data processing with key OS uh, constraints being respected, uh, dynamic scaling of resources. Uh, even uh, to legacy applications that don't need to be modified at all. So if you want to know more about it, go to our repo at GitHub. Uh, there's a kickstart guide there if you want to try it yourself. So there's a, 
there's a, a simple example there with a work queue, and you can see uh, in detail how the orchestration and the, the attestation works. And if you more inter if you're interested in know further about Scorn, go to their website. They have uh, good tutorials there, especially this one about Blender, which uh, teaches you how to run uh, sensitive image processing in remote, untrusted clouds. If you want to see even more uh, use cases and tutorials, go back to our, our repo and stay tuned. So this uh, Asperatos is Scorn and Cube Jobs. They have been funded by the third and the fourth. EU coordinated calls. Um, here you have pointers to the repo again and also to papers we've submitted and published uh, this year. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Not sure if you have time for questions. Do we? Do we have time for questions or questions? No? It's a no. We'll be around. Okay. We are. <laughs> thank you very much.